I'm Tiffany Trader, Managing Editor of HPC Wire. We're here at SC22 in Dallas. And here with me is Dan Stanzione, Director of TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, like I said, we're here in Dallas for SC. And so how far of a drive is it from, from here to uh, TAC in Austin? Uh, right now, I can make it in about two hours and 45 minutes. You throw in rush hour, and you yep. can double that. But uh, yeah, so under three kind, hours. Kind yeah. of a special show. You're still in Texas here. And you get a really cool booth. And you, re you reprise you. the booth from the SC18, which is also here in Dallas. Uh -huh. um, so how'd that come about? Did you have some of the things in storage, or was it a, a recreation? Yeah, a, a lot of it is in storage. They do build a new frame. The doors are new. There's a few things that we've changed out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we designed that basic concept for the booth for SC18 when here in Dallas. And we yeah. wanted to bring sort of Texas Old West with high tech. So we went with yeah. the sort of you know, supercomputing saloon sort of theme yeah. for it, high tech saloon. And what, so. did, what did you have going on there besides the cool mugs and the cool t-shirts that were very much in demand? Yeah, those seem to have become legendary. I always enjoy, I go to like conferences in Germany and watch people walking around in tax shirts that I've never met before because they picked it up at supercomputing. But, uh, um, you know, hidden in the back of that booth with the big long tower there is a couple conference rooms. So we had, you know, dozens of meetings this week um, you know, in the booth that didn't involve me walking across the street yeah. to hotels, so that's always excellent. Um, so we had uh, Robert McClay talk about um, uh, his uh, Exalt and LMOD products that are used all around the world for managing modules and figuring out what libraries get loaded on HPC systems and monitor them. Um, we uh, you know, did a fireside chat for a lot of people doing regional networking here in the area, but mostly it was just a place to meet with people. I mean, you know, we tried to make it open and inviting and a place people want to hang out, and we've had thousands of people through. Um, and it's great after a couple of pandemic years to get to sort of see everybody in the flesh again yep. without the uh, um, structure of Zoom, you know, where you can just chat with folks. It was fantastic. And during the opening night gala, you had a chat with James Randers um, over at the Intel booth. Yeah. You mm -hmm. think they'll have you back? Uh, uh, well, that was the first of, I think, three times I spoke at the Intel booth this week, so they haven't kicked me out yet. Okay. Um, next year's another matter. We'll have to see what happens. But, <laughs> All right. Yeah. But it was so, a fun dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, what, was your, what was your takeaways? Yeah, so James and I just wanted to sort of chat about Exascale software and where it was going and, you know, both the direction Intel's taking and the direction the industry seems to be taking. And, you know, I think what's out there is there's sort of the, a, a pretty heavy C++ focus on the very largest Exascale apps, but we still have tons of Fortran apps, tons of Python apps. Um, I think one of the challenges we face as an industry is we've never really settled on the way to build HPC software. Um, so we still struggle with that, but, uh, um, but you know, Given the reality on the ground, we have to look at multiple pathways to get people to use big machines. And the more we focus on this sort of one for exascale, uh, you know, the more people we're going to leave out in the long run. So for uh, and exascale is just the top of a very broad pyramid, right? In, in HPC at the moment. So the uh, um, so I think we talked about all the pathways to do that um, and the ways we can make software better. I mean, for energy efficiency, right? On almost any architecture, there's a lot of room to go. Um, in making better software. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and the cost savings as well with regards mm -hmm. to uh, energy efficiency is a big big factor. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So at ATTAC, you've got the follow-on to the Frontier, Frontera system coming up. Mm -hmm. That's the continuation of the NSF Leadership Computing Award, which mm -hmm. has been advancing toward the creation of this new leadership class computing facility, LCCF. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and. Um, it uh, sounds like Intel might be a partner, um, and, and I know I know you give hour-long talks about the LCCF, but could sure. you give us some of the highlights? Sure. Well, we'll be, uh, um, and again, it will be the system after Frontera, so to sort of sustain the NSF community. It's really a pivot in NSF strategy for the way they're funding high-performance computing. For the last 20 years, through TerraGrid, Exceed, now Access, um, yeah, they've been sort of four-year one-off system awards. I mean, we've done very well at that. Ranger, Stampede, Stampede 2, a bunch of other systems. But uh, there's been no sort of sustained commitment, right, to either architecture or to um, sort of letting the users know what's going to be out there, right? And you look at things like the big scientific instruments, um, yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope, the Vera Rubin Telescope, the Ecological Observatory Network, right? They operate on decade, 20-year timescales for data and saying, well, you can run here, but in a couple of years, this might go away and there might be something else and there might not, right? It's really not a sustainable way to sort of build up, you know, they're, they're all forced to build their own infrastructures because they just can't count on anything being there, right? So we're trying to pivot to a model where there's 
predictable large systems um, and we can make these sort of long-term partnerships with the big experiments that are really advancing you know, science and society. So we'll be building bigger data centers, of course. We're adding another 15 megawatts of capacity to deal with those systems. And we'll be building a big system to replace Frontera. Um, and yeah, Intel, you know, we've had a fantastic partnership with Intel through a bunch of systems. Um, I'd point out Ranger was an AMD system. Uh, you know, we, we deal largely with Dell recently, but Lone Star 5 was a Cray, right? I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll deal with wherever the best systems are for what we think our users see. Um, but yeah, the idea is to get sort of 10x the scientific throughput out of the next one, um, you know, versus Frontera, the current one, so sort of over 10 years to go up about an order of magnitude. Um, and we're, uh, you know, we're still two and a half years out on actually deploying the system. We're about a year and a half from starting on the data center work. Uh, so I haven't really made a final decision on what it looks like yet, but um, you can imagine who the main contenders are um, and what the options are to put things together. And it really is, uh, where we think our users are on software and, and how fast they can adapt to changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, the ecosystem being right now, I mean, there's, there's more, more, more choices out there you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to look at and uh, assess, so. Yeah, well, in some ways there's more choices. In, in some ways there's sort of consolidation, right? Mm -hmm. You come off yep. a decade and a half of sort of mix and match, right? right. You pick your, you right. know, maybe you use Intel for your CPUs, you use NVIDIA yeah. for your GPUs, you went to Mellanox yeah. or somebody for your network. Um, and now what we see is sort of consolidation, yeah. right? Where there's sort of the AMD ecosystem, yeah. the NVIDIA ecosystem, the Intel ecosystem, yeah. um, in some sense that simplifies some decisions, but, uh, right. but it's harder to sort of, uh, you know, you sort of have to buy the formula instead of the sort of cookie cutter approach right. to putting things together. And that's, that, in some ways has given us less choices um, and made some of those decisions harder. All right, mm -hmm. so I'm going to skip over that entire question because okay. you've <laughs> answered it. That's, uh -huh. that's great. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit more. You know, with these swim lanes, we're getting some, some inter interesting combinations. And mm -hmm. one of the combinations was uh, Intel Max series. They, they kind of cut, uh, drew a horizontal line at the top of their, their stack with the mm -hmm. Max uh, series GPU, AKA Sapphire Rapids plus HBM, and mm -hmm. then the uh, um, Ponte Vecchio Ponte GPU yeah. that also has mm -hmm. HBM. So I was kind of thinking like, it might be kind of interesting to see what use cases you get combining the high HBM with the high HPM. Yeah, hits. so I've been really excited about HBM for a long time. It's a sort of a shame that it's taken so long to get some of this to market, and there's been a lot of complications with just sort of integrating it, stacking it on the die, and, and making all of that work. But we know, I think um, really every large operator knows that we're memory bandwidth bound in a lot of cases, right? And that's one of the reasons, um, it's not the only reason, but it's a reason that GPUs have done so well in the last few years is there's a lot more memory bandwidth per operation than you get out of a CPU um, with traditional dim based memory, right? Because the GPUs have had not always HBM, but they've had you know the stacked fast memory GDDR before um, that's given them a huge bandwidth advantage. Um, over the CPUs. And with HBM, we can start really comparing if we take memory bandwidth out of the equation, you know, what's best in a CPU sort of cache-based architecture, or what's best in a GPU streaming core type architecture. Um, but really balancing that better, I think is gonna be a huge help. And you know, we've tested some HBM chips now that they're starting to see samples of mainstream chips. We got the Fujitsu ones that they put in Fugaku a couple of years ago and saw some interesting stuff there, but we're seeing, you know, on the same Sapphire Rapid scores at the same clock rate, we see a huge leap forward in application performance when you integrate HBM. Of course, you're trading off some power for that HBM. Mm. You're trading off uh, capacity, right? Because if you do an all HBM chip, it's really expensive to do HBM and put main memory in. So you're probably going to do one or the other. So you have to fit everything into a smaller memory, which is a trade off. But a lot of times we see application performance jump by 50% or more. Um, which, you know, when you're weighing how many CPUs, how many GPUs, 50% better CPU performance changes the equation some. So, uh, and then yes, having it on both sides of the system, um, that much faster memory, you start to see, you know, you're no longer limited by how much you can fit in GPU RAM, right? Um, so you can, uh, both the HBM and then the faster connectivity that we see with NVLink and the other fabrics coming out, to put things together. Um, you can think about bigger models so that don't have to squeeze into that GPU RAM. So um, that, I think that's a pretty exciting development. It's really expensive right now, but uh, if we can 
get it to work, you know, yield reliably at high levels, um, I, I think it can be a game changer. Yeah. And um, continuing, continuing the theme of architectural decisions and, and future directions, um, Jack Dungara was here, mm -hmm. uh, li top 500 list author and uh, venture of the, uh, the, the Limpac bench, High Performance Limpac benchmark, mm -hmm. um, and newly minted uh, Turing uh, winner, yep. um, has been saying that um, HPC is facing a crisis uh, driven by the almost absolute reliance on commodity hardware. Sometimes mm -hmm. you hear the term uh, "cots" commodity off the shelf. Um, mm -hmm. Do you? And, and he, there's this there's this phrase uh, reinventing HPC. There's a panel of people like uh, Jack Dungara and Dan Dorsten. Reed and, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and others. Um, so do do you think HPC needs to be reinvented? And if uh, if you were king of HPC, what would you dictate? Yeah. Uh, so. It's a, an interesting question. It was a fascinating discussion. And by the way, congratulations to Jack on the Turing Award, richly deserved, so many contributions over such a sustained period. Um, so I work with Jack a lot. Um, congratulations, Jack, if you're listening. But uh, um, I got to tell him that in person this week. So, but, uh, um, but yeah, there were some really interesting things. I think, you know, the drivers, uh, you know, when we talk about commodity off the shelf, right? That sort of started with the Beowulf project 30, well, be 30 years next year, right? Uh, you know, 29 years ago, NASA Goddard, Thomas Sterling, Don Becker, right? And the, the, the economics then, and I think it's still the economics now, is uh, supercomputing is not a big enough market versus the cost of a fab, right? We talked about HBM and fabrication, right? New fabs, you see the CHIPS Act, right? It takes $20 billion to bring a new fab online, right? It's a huge number. It's the whole HPC marketplace for a year, right? So the, the notion that we're going to have fully custom silicon for HPC, um, you know, it just isn't there. I, you know, I firmly believe that any component we're going to get um, at scale, you know, on the, the chip side uh, is either what the cloud guys want or something the cloud guys would buy because if it's not going to be used by the big clouds, um, there's not going to be enough of them to make it cost effective. Uh, so I think that part of the off the shelf argument um, still holds. At the same time, I do think HPC really needs to evolve. Um, you know, we've had so many conversations where, uh, for a community where we're building the very biggest machines in the world to tackle the hardest science problems, we can be awfully conservative sometimes, right, about making changes. Uh, you know, fundamentally, we still program in MPI, OpenMP, as we have for 30 years, right? Um, we're very slow to change architectures. Um, so certainly there's the bounce back and forth between flavors of x86, but really CPU plus GPU is the only thing we've really achieved in that in 25 years. I think Torsten Hoffler made a great point on that panel that really the network is where we're innovating, right? That's the thing that's not like the cloud, right, in many ways, although with the rise of AI, I think the cloud guys want to be more like that, and they're going to have a huge impact on networks <laughs> coming up. Uh, but we need to have, um, you know, personally, I believe the long-term future will see semi-custom silicon. You see both uh, Intel and AMD each spend about $40 billion on FPGA companies, right? And you can imagine a world where um, there's no custom cores for HPC, but we can tweak existing designs from a library of parts to say, I need a few more vector units, a few more accelerators on a semi-custom chip um, with sort of stock IP that's built. Um, but, uh, but I think we need to feel like we can explore and, and do more experimentation in that area and not just do more of the same or we will get left behind by, there, there's a huge amount of innovation going on in the cloud to deal with very, very large data analysis, very large AI problems, um, you know, they're not as good at the modeling and simulation stuff, but I think if we don't evolve, we would get left behind, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there's different architectural directions. You can, you can bring everything close together, or you can do this thing that people are talking about, composable, yeah. disaggregated. We see uh, some examples um, exa of it, but it hasn't you know, reached its full mm -hmm. fruition. Um, you, were, you were on a panel, ta uh, the, the SmackDown, composability SmackDown, where it was kind of a setup where some people mm -hmm. were on the chosen, kind of chosen for the four, and some, you know, like a, like a high school debate mm -hmm. kind of thing, uh, but more fun. Um, can you uh, can you comprise? You were on the four side, mm -hmm. the pro side. Can you comprise? Can, um, revisit some of your arguments in favor of composability, and then strongman strongman some of your 
opponents. Sure, absolutely, yeah, because I, I will tell you, you know, we did that for fun, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and we were, we were all prepared to argue either side if we needed to in those mm -hmm. arguments. Uh, so, and it, it was definitely a fun thing to do. Um, but it is an example of what I was just talking about, about, you know, the need to evolve, the need to experiment in terms of how we put things together. Um, and, you know, arguably there are, well, I think the biggest four argument, right, and it may not apply to the very largest exascale systems at this point, um, but if you were to walk around the floor here, we're surrounded by hundreds of people selling HPC products, right? And if you talk to each one of them and all the users wandering around about their applications, if you tried to get an answer to what is the right number of GPUs per node, um, you could talk for days, you will get many conflicting answers, and in the end it will come down to the answer, it depends, right? It depends on your workload, depends on how tightly coupled they are, it depends on how much memory you need, a whole bunch of things, right? If you went around and asked the same question about how much local storage you should put in a node, um, you'll get the same range of answers and it'll end up being, it depends, right? And uh, perhaps the same for uh, the amount of memory you have in a node, right? There are people who are like, well, we should go small HPM, no DIMMs because everything can fit in a gigabyte per core. And there are others like, no, we have applications that are 64 gigabytes a core. Right, so there's no single solution for hardware for that. Um, and if there's no single solution, then I think composability has the opportunity to make sense right? <laughs> um, in what we do. And I think that's the biggest four argument is, you know, it, if you're buying not thousands of nodes where you have enough infrastructure, I mean, if you're the cloud, you just buy a hundred more racks of whatever it is, right? And you see in the cloud, um, they have literally hundreds of instance types now, right? Of different combinations of hardware and nodes. Um, and they only have hundreds of instance types because they have customers who want each one of those types, right? So, but if you're building a departmental scale cluster, you can't do hundreds of different configurations buying static servers, right? You're gonna have to do some form of composability to make that happen. And I think that's the pro argument. I think the con argument, um, which uh, has a lot of compelling parts because not everything wins in technology just because it's cool. And in fact, it doesn't always win because it's best, it's because it's economically effective and usable, right? So um, the risk with composability, the, the, the most fundamental one is uh, almost anything you do where you're taking something tightly coupled and breaking it apart, you're adding latency, right? So, um, so, and with CXL evolving standards and stuff, it's possible that latency can come way down um, from what it's been and it may be good enough, but you could be adding latency and that you know potentially slows things down the opposite of what we normally try and do. So that's a problem. The other one is uh, the usability argument. I personally think we can hide a lot of the complexity from the users, but your system staff need to know how to do that, right? So uh, they, there's, they're gonna have and feel uh, so, some, uh, some of that complexity. But again, I think our system staff need to learn to evolve and not do exactly the same thing. Um, so uh, there are, there are definitely trade-offs there. It's not clear there's a winner. I, said, I would say we're making some investments at the experimental scale because I don't know the answer to these questions and we need to find out, right? And so turning a blind eye to it just because, well, maybe it'll add latency. Yeah. Um, you know, we've run GPUs over PCI very effectively for the last decade and a half. Um, we can get less than that latency in a composable system. How is that not useful, right? <laughs> so. Do you think that the infrastructure will be moving towards uh, embracing on-chip optical and silicon photonics, and what do you think the timeline might be for that? So I'm not sure of the timeline. Um, all of these things, uh, you know, the physics is there, the technology is kind of there. There's a lot of engineering challenges, and like we've seen with HBM, right, the little things of, well, when we start stacking dies, we have to think about the joint failure rate of those coming together, and how can we get that down low enough? Um, it may stay expensive for a few more years, right, and not come to pass. It already hasn't come to pass as fast as I think people thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, and a I don't work close enough on it to, mm -hmm. you know, really have a sense of it's going to be this timeline. Um, but I think it's important that it happens because we spend an awful lot of power um, getting a signal off the chip onto the motherboard, um, you know, making the trace big enough, you know, need enough fan out from the transistors to talk to the trace and then getting it out to another digital electro-optical converter. If we can just send the photons right off the chip, we're gonna save a lot of power and we're gonna save some latency. Um, and I think that that's gonna really help to be able to compose blocks together when we can have these you know, fiber optic speed you know, connections chip to chip. Um, 
you know, perhaps at the board level or across very small boxes <laughs> uh, where we're composing modules. So. Uh, one of the people who was on the against side was Ruth Stanishaw from Stanford, mm -hmm. said uh, something to the effect of her staff doesn't want to have to, doesn't you know have the capacity to manage anything else or any more complexities. I mean, you're at a well-resourced center. What would your response be to that kind of comment? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sensitive to that. By the way, Ruth just walked by while oh. we were talking. So <laughs> the uh, um, the um, but I think she's out of earshot now. So I can say <laughs> this. Um, but yeah, I mean, we you, everything we do is a challenge for staff, and we do ask an awful lot of system staff. Um, I think it's important that we you know, continue to work as several organizations are doing to sort of professionalize the role of that staff and recognize the contributions that they make to the research process. Um, you know, we're not really IT. We're building custom research instruments um, that happen to use IT components, right? And so there's often a um, sort of the, the look at all center staff to be, you know, sort of service people who you're supposed to be, you know, seen and not heard perhaps. So. Um, and I do think we need to change that culture and recognize how hard they work and what their contributions are. But at the same time, again, they're going to have to evolve, right? We're starting to, you know, we're seeing more object stores, right? We're seeing, yeah, running InfiniBand's a lot harder than running Ethernet. We did it anyway, because to make commodity clusters work, it was important to have low latency networks. I think this is going to fall in the same category. Great. Well, we're back here in Dallas. Uh, mm -hmm. Four years after uh, the last yep. time, mm -hmm. um, and next year we're going to be in, in Denver. It's going to be the 35th anniversary. They have about it's 11 th 11,000 attendees here. Mm -hmm. In St. Louis, it was about 3,500. Yeah. So it's just it, it didn't incrementally come back. It just kind of you know bounced back to the, the regular mm -hmm. water level of attendance. Uh, after you know, not after just meeting virtually. So, what's it been like for you to to be here back at SC, and what have some of the highlights been for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to me, it's tremendous to be back in person. I mean, last year there were still plenty of legitimate pandemic concerns. I, I didn't go last year, okay. uh, so um, this year, yeah, I think we're back at maybe ninety percent, right? So there's still, I think. Most of the issues are not really pandemic related. It's you know visa backlogs and stuff like that, getting people here. Mm -hmm. A third Maybe of companies the people pulling here back are international, actually. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, so some it, got in, but you see yep. less from China, perhaps, yeah, and less from, from a few uh, from countries that uh, um, we Thanks. used to. But you know, so much of the interaction that happens at SC and really any conference is the stuff that's not in the formal program, right? And that I, I really miss that. I mean. First of all, there's the rumor mill and all the information that spreads, <laughs> but catching up with colleagues and seeing what's going on with them, a chance to chat with you in person. Yeah. Um, it's a different experience, right? So, you know, I think the conference did a great job and many conferences, you know, being uh, remote and then hybrid. Hybrid's a lot harder than remote, but uh, um, where you still got everything you would get out of sitting in the sessions, but you didn't get everything else. Um, and this year we get everything else back and it's been a, a great experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like all the connections we make mm -hmm. and all the information we share and then mm -hmm. just those serendipitous moments are real fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll be there in Denver next year, SC23. Dorian Arnold is the chair and I look forward to seeing you there. We'll be there, looking great. forward to it again. All right, thanks for watching. Look, look forward to you uh, next time. Thank you.